audio lecture for 20R, World War I, 1914 to 1918, also known as the Great War. Key concept. Key concept. First, we're going to discuss the long-term causes of World War I. We've been building up to this war for quite some time now. So let's talk about these long-term causes first, and then we'll talk about the short-term, meaning the immediate causes. Rival alliances were part of the long-term causes. Rival alliances, the alliances of the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente had been formed prior to the world. In 1871, the balance of power of Europe was upset by the decisive Prussian victory in the Franco-Prussian War and the creation of the German Empire, as we know. Bismarck thereafter feared French revenge and negotiated treaties to try to isolate France, just in case there were future problems. Bismarck also feared Russia, especially after the Congress of Berlin, when Russia blamed Germany for not gaining territory in the Balkans region. In 1879, the dual alliance emerged between Germany and Austria. Bismarck convinced Austria that they should no longer be enemies, even though he had attacked Austria in the Austro-Prussian um, War, that they would be better together than apart. Bismarck sought to thwart Russian expansion, especially in the Balkans region, and knowing that Austria had designs in the Balkans region, it made sense for them to combine against Russia. The dual alliance was based on German support for, the, for Austria in its struggle with Russia over expansion in this region of the Balkans. This became a major feature of European diplomacy until the end of World War I. The Triple Alliance, as it will eventually be called, is, uh, forms in 1881, where Italy joined in the alliance with Germany and Austria, making it a Triple Alliance now rather than a Dual Alliance. However, it's important for you all to note that Italy will actually switch sides in 1915 after the first year of the war is fought. So Italy starts off on the side of the Triple Alliance, also known as the Central Powers, once the war begins. But they will switch sides and join with the Allied Powers, which were the Triple Entente, later uh, in 1915. Italy sought support for its imperialistic ambitions in the Mediterranean and in Africa. Uh, especially them trying to take over Ethiopia. They would need big friends to help with that. And of course, it didn't work because they weren't able to take Ethiopia until after World War I. Uh, the Russian-German Reinsurance Treaty of 1887 was also something that came into play here. It promised the neutrality of both Germany and Russia if either country went to war with another country. So you see here, Germany was making deals with Austria um, against Russia, but they were also making a deal. It was not an alliance, but a basically a neutrality agreement with Germany, I'm sorry, with Russia at the same time. Bismarck was a smart politician, remember, he's playing both sides of it. This is why, one of the reasons I say that Wilhelm II was dumb to uh, force Bismarck into retirement. Bismarck had set the stage nicely for Germany, uh, but uh, alas, he will be forced out. Kaiser Wilhelm II refused to renew the reinsurance treaty after removing Bismarck in 1890. And so that deal that Germany had with Russia falls apart as a result. This can be seen as a huge diplomatic blunder. Russia wanted to renew this reinsurance treaty, um, but now had no assurances it was safe from a German invasion. So therefore Russia will ultimately be seeking other alliances against a growing Germany. This is why Russia will eventually be part of the other alliance, the Triple Entente, against Germany. France courted Russia instead, and the two became allies. That will be the beginning of the Triple Entente. Starts with France and Russia. 
Germany was now out of necessity, developed even closer ties with Austria and make sure that they maintain that alliance. Splendid isolation for Britain. Well, after 1891, Britain was the only non-aligned power in Europe and enjoyed relative security as the world's largest navy and protection by the sea as an island nation. That will all come to a screeching halt, however. The Anglo-Japanese alliance was one of the things that came about. In 1902, Britain sought a Japanese agreement to benevolent neutrality with each other to counter the possible Russian threat in India. This would be the end of Britain's splendid isolation. And eventually we have the creation of the Entente Cordiale in 1904. Due to the Anglo-German naval arms race which was going on, and the English and the German were both in an arms race with each other, Britain and France decided to put their differences aside, both of them being concerned about the growth of Germany, especially the growth of aggression in Germany. Britain and France settled all outstanding colonial disputes in Africa and instead decided to put their differences aside to focus on the enemy they both had, Germany. France accepted British rule of the Sudan, as we talked about before. Britain recognized French control of Morocco, and this becomes the basis for what will be the Triple Entente. 1907, Britain, France, and Russia form the Triple Entente, whereas the Triple Alliance, remember, is Germany, Austria, and Italy. They formed the Triple Entente to check the power of the Triple Alliance. This was not truly a formal alliance, but one done in principle. It will later become the basis of the Allied powers in World War I. Another factor is the Anglo-German arms race that I mentioned on a previous slide. Militarism led to a belief in the inevitability of a general European war. Germany had overtaken Britain industrially in the 1890s. They actually started to outproduce Great Britain. They had been on top since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Bert, Bertha von Suttner from Austria was the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize and she did so by opposing the arms race that both of these nations were uh, contributing to. Lay Down Your Arms would be the book that she wrote in 1889 that contributed to the founding of peace societies in both Austria and Germany, but to no avail. The British policy was to have its fleet larger than the combined fleets of any two rival nations. In 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm II began the expansion of the German Navy to protect its growing international trade and colonialism in the new imperialism. The Haldane mission of 1912 was where Britain tried unsuccessfully to end the naval arms race with Germany because by this point Great Britain was not able to have a fleet that was double the size of Germany since Germany's had grown so much. It was breaking the bank, if you will, but Germany would not back down. By World War I, both Britain and Germany possessed what were known as dreadnoughts. They were new super battleships with awesome firing range and power. It's part of the arms race. There's the Royal Navy's HMS Dreadnought, world's first dreadnought. A third factor, a third cause, long-term cause, is imperialism in and of itself. Imperialism led to increased tensions between the great powers over Africa. The Berlin Conference, remember, of 1884-1885, uh, Germany's late entry into imperialism led Bismarck to establish these rules for carving up Africa, hoping to avoid an all-out war. Germany aggressively set out to acquire colonies at the after this, though, sometimes coming into conflict with rival European powers, largely due to the fact that Bismarck was ousted out of the German government by Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was much more aggressive when it came to taking territories. 
the Kruger telegram that I mentioned in a previous lecture uh, triggered British anger at Germany when the Kaiser congratulated the Boers on their victories over British troops in South Africa. It just made Britain come and clobber the Boers even more and created resentment towards Germany for um, uh, basically uh, trying to say that Great Britain was no longer a great power. In 1906, the Algeciras Conference settled the first Moroccan crisis. Kaiser Wilhelm II had urged Moroccan independence despite its being a French colony. He was going in there and stirring up trouble among the Moroccan people to try to get them to rebel against the French who controlled the colony. He did this on purpose to try to anger France and to try to maybe get his own sphere of influence in Morocco to challenge French domination of that region. Similar situation to what he had done with the Boers in South Africa against the British. Remember what I said about Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was a bit of a punk. Anyhow, Britain supported French dominance in Morocco and Tunisia, and this is why Britain and France, who had been long-standing enemies for so many centuries, decided to put their differences aside and form an alliance against Germany, who was antagonizing them both. Britain, France, Russia, and the U.S. eventually saw Germany as a potential threat to dominate all of Europe. Now, the U.S. will not be involved in World War I until the last year of the war, but we are, even though we are, quote, in splendid isolation ourselves, end quote, at this point before the war begins, we are keeping a close watch on what is going on in Europe. Germany became further isolated, except for Austria's support. Germany decried encirclement by other powers to block Germany's emergence as a world power. The Triple Entente was created in response, and that's exactly what they did. They encircled Germany, with Great Britain and France being on one side and Russia being on the opposite side. The second Moroccan crisis happened in 1911, where Germany sent a gunboat to Morocco to protest the French occupation of the city of Fez. Britain once again supported France. Some observers believe that this conflict could escalate into a world war, but Germany will back down for minor concessions in equatorial Africa. So once again, you see the tensions boiling up and then eventually just, you know, stabilizing a bit, but keep, they keep coming up and up again. And eventually one of them is going to explode. One, that, that one will be in the Balkans region. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so here we go. Nationalism created a powder keg in the Balkans region, and this is a yet another one of the long-term causes leading to the war. The Ottoman Empire, which we know had been referred to as the sick man of Europe, had receded from the Balkans, leaving a bit of a power vacuum in that region. This was the Eastern question that had been um, going on for quite some time. Who would fill the power vacuum left by a, a faltering Ottoman Empire in that region? Pan-Slavism was a nationalist movement to unite all Slavic people, encouraged the Serbs, Bosnians, Slovenes, and Croats to seek a single political entity in Southeastern Europe, and Pan-Slavism was supported by Russia because they of course were Slavic as well thinking that they could have interests in this region if they helped to support this pan-Slavism movement. As the southern Slavs big brother to the east Russia focused on Balkan territories in the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires after its humiliating loss in the Russo-Japanese war. This will result in the first Balkan crisis, the Bosnian crisis of 1908. The young Turks led by Ataturk or Mustafa Kemal Pasha set up a parliamentary government in the Ottoman Empire, but the regime seemed weak to the other European powers. So in 1911 and 1912, Italy took the Turkish province of Lib Libya showing how weak the Ottomans had become. By 1908, Austria annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina, 
while Russia failed to gain access, thus leaving Serbia frustrated because Serbia wanted Bosnia with the support of Russia behind it. Again, this became another region where there were scrambling for territories. You can see this in the picture at the bottom left. Austria's action ultimately violated what had been decided at the Congress of Berlin in 1878. This is different than the earlier Berlin conference. I mean, sorry, the later Berlin conference. But war was averted because Russia had not yet, was not yet ready, and France was not yet willing to fight over the Balkans region. But once, so once again, a uh, boil up and then it settled down, but it will eventually boil over. The great powers struggled to keep a lid on Balkan troubles on the eve of the first Balkan war. You see this here is the boiling point. Balkan troubles is what the pot is and all the leaders of these different nations sitting on top of the pot, trying to keep it under control. The First Balkan War in 1912. Serbia, Greece, and Bulgaria all allied to successfully drive the Turks out of the Balkans. Serbia sought port access to the Adriatic Sea, but was rebuffed when Austria created the state of Albania to block Serbia from doing so. The Second Balkan War happens in 1913, just the year later. Bulgaria was angered that Serbia and Greece had acquired significant territory in Macedonia and thus attacked both countries. Serbia defeated Bulgaria in its quest for Macedonia and temporarily gained Albania as a result. Russia backed Serbia. Serbia was basically able to do this because they knew they had Russia's backing. Austria, with German support against Russia, prevented Serbia from being able to hold on to Albania for very long. Serbia was frustrated as it still had no access to the Adriatic Sea with the loss of this territory. Albania will eventually gain its own independence, again leaving Serbia frustrated. Russia was seen was humiliated since it could not really help Serbia acquire Albania. Here's the Balkans after the Second Balkan War, or Balkan Crisis, as they're sometimes called. The Third Balkan War between Austria and Serbia became, ultimately, the beginning of World War I and the summer of 1914. More about that later. All right, so this will lead us to the immediate causes of World War I. You need to understand that, really, all the pieces were in place just something needed to light the match, needed to start the, the, the powder keg burning. And so you can look at the long-term causes as a long fuse leading up to the war, but something had to set that long fuse on fire. And that's where this comes in with the immediate causes of the war. Of course, it was because of this frustration that Serbia had with Austrian domination of territories in the Balkans, Serbia wanting to gain access to the Adriatic Sea, Russia supporting Serbia in that, hoping that Russia could keep their interests open in the Balkans region. Um, of course, Russia's support of Serbia um, would also mean that, you know, since Russia is allied with France and England, and of course, Austria on the other side is allied with Germany and Italy, this could cause the whole house of cards to fall, which is exactly what will happen. Okay, so the immediate causes of World War I. June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was the Austrian heir to the throne, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. His name was Gavrilo Princip. He was a member of the ultra-nationalist Serbian group called the Black Hand. The Archduke was visiting Bosnia Herzegovina when the assassination happened. Here's Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie moments before the assassination, where they will both be killed. Kaiser Wilhelm II, after the assassination happened, pledged unwavering support to Austria to punish Serbia. This is known as Germany's blank check. 
to Austria. Austria made harsh demands on Serbia by requiring Serbia to punish all forms of anti-Austrian sentiment, meaning the ultra-nationalist groups, and participate in joint judicial proceedings against anti-Austrian activity. Of course, Serbia would not be able to accept all of those demands. And in July, July 28, 1914, Austria was, because Serbia would not accept their demands, declared war on Serbia. Austria declares war on Serbia July 28, 1914. They claimed, Austria claimed that Serbia had not accommodated adequately Austria's demands after the assassination of the Archduke. On July 29th, Austria began bombarding Belgrade. They knew they had Germany's support, so they started bombing Belgrade, which is the capital of Serbia. This represented the first military aggression of the war. Serbia, little tiny Serbia, knew they had Russia in their pocket too. And of course, Russia was allied with France and England. In response, Russia started to mobilize its armies against Austria and Germany. But it would take a long time for Russia to be able to fully mobilize. France, in response, started to mobilize on Germany's western border. On August 1st, Germany officially entered the fracas by declaring war on France in response to France starting to mobilize along the border between France and Germany. On August 3rd, Germany started to invade Belgium on its way through to France. We'll talk more about that action as part of the Schlieffen Plan in a later slide. In effect, Germany had turned the little localized war in the Balkans into a world war by attacking Belgium and France. In response, France declared war on Germany. On August 4th, Britain, uh, remaining loyal to their alliance, declared war on Germany as well. And the House of Cards began to fall. So the two opposing alliances emerged, but you know they had already really been in place since the late 1800s and the early 1900s, okay? Uh, the Central Powers uh, basically was around the Triple Alliance that had started in the late 1800s between Germany and Austria. Uh, we know that Italy had been added to that alliance, uh, re but remember they will switch sides after 1915. But also at this point, by the beginning of the war, the Ottoman Empire, because of their interest in the region of the Balkans, um, had also been added into this alliance. So it really wasn't a triple alliance, it was more of a quadruple alliance. But they will become known as the Central Powers, because when you look on the map, they're the ones in the central part of Europe. The Allies were what had been the Triple Entente, France, Russia, and Great Britain. Later on, Japan will be added to the Allied Powers. Italy will switch sides, as we know, in 1915. Romania will also join with the Allies, and of course, the United States for the last year of the war. World War I combatants. You see the Central Powers, Germany and her allies in pink. You see Britain and her allies in red, which basically represents the Triple Entente. So you see why we call them the Central Powers, uh, with Germany, Austria, Turkey there. Uh, Italy, as we know, will eventually switch sides and join Britain's side of the war in 1915. Um, the Allied Powers will ultimately encircle the Central Powers. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the fighting that happened along the Western Front of the war. First and foremost, we need to understand why Germany decided to declare war on France and march through Belgium, which kind of, you know, made this more than just an Austria versus Serbia thing any longer. It all had to do with the Schlieffen Plan that had been put in place um, in case war occurred, um, it had been put in place in the 1890s by General von Schlieffen. Ultimately, 
Germany recognized its precarious location in between, um, you know, in the central part of Europe, in between members of the Triple Entente on either side of her, with France and Britain um, on the west, and of course Russia on the east. So basically General von Schlieffen was put in charge of creating a plan that if war did happen, even though alliances were supposed to keep war from happening, it ultimately brought everybody into the war, had the exact opposite effect. But he was set, put in charge of a, a plan to try to say if war does happen, how will we try to avoid a two-front war? Germany recognized its location was precarious between two sides of the Triple Entente. So, in order to avoid a two-front war, Schlieffen came up with this plan. First of all, it would have to happen in 42 days, very quickly, okay? So roughly, you know, six weeks. The plan was this. In order, they they recognized that the Germans assumed three assumptions to this. The first assumption was they assumed that it would take Russia longer to mobilize than anybody else because they were so far behind industrially. That was true. So they thought 42 days, they'll probably be mobilized but within 42 days. So if we can instead knock out the Western um, uh, opponents to us before Russia is able to mobilize, then we can avoid having to fight against the um, both sides at the same time. So gave themselves this 42 day plan. First, they would have to attack France. France would be expecting um, an invasion from the shared border that they had with Germany. So second assumption was that since France would be as, um, expecting the invasion along their shared border. Instead, Germany would move through Belgium to attack France. The problem with this was that Belgium had declared itself neutral. And so to go through Belgium as combatants, Germany would be violating Belgium's neutrality, which is against the rules of sovereignty and against the rules of war. But the idea was this, to invade France by going through Belgium, to, through the north, coming into France from the north by going through Belgium, defeat France quickly by sweeping around Paris, capturing Paris very quickly, and then to redeploy the troops after forcing France to capitulate, they could then focus, redeploy to the east to defeat Russia before she fully mobilized. Now, there was a third assumption to this. The third assumption was that, what about England, okay? Well, Germany had assumed that England, even though they had an alliance with France, because of their history, that they had hated each other for so many centuries, that perhaps England would not honor her alliance with France unless England were attacked outright. So, when Russia began to mobilize on July 28th, 1914, after Austria declared war on Serbia, the 42-day timetable had begun for the Schlieffen Plan. And this is why Germany believed that she had to attack um, France first or she could be saddled with this two-front war against Russia and France. So that is why Germany attacked France first. Okay, so this French cartoon of Germany after its invasion of Belgium shows, of course, a German soldier wearing a butcher's apron with blood, of course, splattered all over it, has a machete, he has some kind of um, blood all over him. You see the imagery really here showing the butchery of um, the Germans against the Belgians. Now, folks, what I want to say right here is something that to explain why the Schlieffen plan failed. That Schlieffen plan, remember, was based on three big assumptions. The first one being that it would take Russia about six to eight weeks to mobilize, and they actually mobilized faster. Um, the second being that Belgium, um, that they would be able to march through Belgium to attack France um, without Belgium actually minding that they were violating their neutrality. Wrong. 
Um, and the third being that England would not come in and honor her alliance with France because of the history that she had with France being, you know, bad, unless England were attacked outright. That will prove wrong specifically because of Germany invading through Belgium. Great Britain and Belgium had a close relationship. As a matter of fact, for a while, the King of Belgium, King Leopold, he was the uncle of Queen Victoria back in the middle of the 1800s. So Great Britain had guaranteed Belgium's neutrality. So by Germany marching through Belgium, they basically guaranteed that Great Britain would come to the aid of France. And ultimately, this will cause the failure of the Schlieffen plan. What happens is the timetable gets knocked off. They will not be able to effectively knock France out um, in that 42 day time period. Ultimately, Russia does mobilize more quickly than they had anticipated and Germany will have to divert some of their troops to go fight on the Eastern Front while maintaining more of their troops along the Western Front, committing them to a two front war. We'll talk about that as we go through the next few slides. So the Schlieffen plan ultimately fails because it was based on three assumptions that all proved faulty. All right, so the Western Front, how does this um, front line get established? By September 14th, 1914, we have the Western Front lines basically being entrenched along the Marne River, which is sort of like a natural um, dividing line between France and Germany. After the Germans came within sight of Paris, the French and now British forces that had honored their alliance largely because of what happened with Belgium started to push the German forces back, push them all the way back to the Marne River. The French army was led by General Joseph Joffrey, and the Battle of the Marne represented the end of mobility on the Western Front, especially for Germany. Germany will have to entrench themselves along the Marne River instead, and they will not be able to completely knock France out in that 42-day timetable of the Schlieffen Plan. Why did the Schlieffen Plan fail? Again, Belgium's surprising resistance to Germany's invasion slowed the German offensive into France. The left of the German line ultimately failed to lure the French army into Alsace and Lorraine to destroy it. And Russia mobilized way more quickly, requiring German divisions to be sent there instead um, of them being able to focus all their attention um, on the west to knock it out first, to, to, to knock out France first. And of course, Great Britain coming to the aid of France helped that as well. French and British counterattacks along the Battle of the Marne was decisive in halting the German invasion. Key concept. Trench warfare will be the new style of war that will be fought in World War I. Trench warfare resulted in a stalemate that lasted four bloody years. Now the word stalemate, sometimes people misunderstand what it means. It does not mean nothing is going on. Ultimately stalemate warfare in World War I meant that millions of men were dying for little or no gains at all. For almost four years, the front lines along the Western Front, along the Marne River, will basically stay in the same place. Millions will die for yards of territory here and there, but really no particular gains on either side. This kind of warfare is extremely wasteful of human life. The long line of trenches that stretched from the North Sea to the Swiss border in the south it stretched about 440 miles as the crow flies, but there were actually 25,000 miles of trench in total. That's because the trenches did not run in straight lines. They ran in like little kitty corners and round and winding around and ultimately for that 440 miles longwise, 25,000 miles total in switches and um, twists and turns of the trenches. 
Despite massive casualties on both sides, few gains were made in terms of gaining ground, and this is why we call it stalemate warfare. Millions die for very little gain at all. Between 1914 and 1916, the stalemate continued along the Western Front, while Germany, of course, was having to also fight on the Eastern Front against Russia. By 1916 on the Western Front, massive casualties had resulted, but neither side could really break through the enemy lines. So, we have the Battle of Verdun happening between February to December of 1916. That is a long battle, folks. Shows you how wasteful this stalemate type of warfare can be. Germany, in this Battle of Verdun, sought to bring an end to the stalemate, um, to uh, have a battle of attrition that would, quote, bleed France white and force it to sue for peace. France will ultimately lose about 540,000 men in this battle. The bombardments of the Germans to try to take Verdun happen for months and months and months. France will lose a, a half a million men. Germany lost almost the same, 430,000 men. Neither side will actually gain any territory. The French count this as a victory because they held Verdun and were not, um, would not allow Germany to take it. But ultimately, with a million men lost in this one battle, this was the war's second bloodiest battle. You're probably wondering what the first bloodiest battle was. That one happens this same year as well. The Battle of the Somme River. The Battle of the Somme between July and November of 1916 was when this was fought. It's a little bit further north on the line um, of the Western Front. This time the British and French fought together against the Germans and it was a British and French offensive trying to break through the German lines. Whereas at Verdun, it was the Germans trying to break through the French lines. The British and the French offensive aimed to break through the German lines. And this will be the bloodiest battle of the war. The British and French will bombard the German um, trenches for months and months and months until they feel that they have, um, they, they have killed enough of the men in the trenches that they can go quote, over the top into no man's land, the territory between the trenches, to try to take the enemy trench. Ultimately, however, some of the Germans had dug tunnels, they had escaped some of the bombardment, and so when the British and French come over the top into no man's land, they are mowed down by the Germans who remained in their trenches. This will be the bloodiest battle of the war. The losses of men Britain lost 420,000 men, France lost 200,000 men, and Germany lost 650,000 men. 1.2 million men lost in this one battle. Over a million men lost in the Battle of Verdun. Both of these battles happen in 1916. Both of them are costly and no gains were made with either of them. Wasteful, bloody, stalemate warfare. A novel was written by Eric Remark, published in 1929 called All Quiet on the Western Front. He actually had served on the German front lines on the Western Front um, and he survived the war to write this anti-war book. All Quiet on the Western Front ultimately illustrates the horrors of trench warfare. Here's some soldiers living in the trenches. A lookout while others sleep. Terrible conditions in these trenches. Dead bodies in there with you. They fill up with water. You get trench foot, gangrene, rats everywhere, lice everywhere, dead bodies everywhere, 
disgusting. You can't go anywhere. You try to go over the top, you're going to be mowed down. Awful, awful conditions. Now, the technological advancements that had come about due to the Industrial Revolution actually are part of the reason why the war increased casualties, why this war was such a lethal war. This is sometimes seen as the world's first fully industrialized war. World War I represented the Industrial Revolution applied to warfare. The machine gun is a new weapon. Perhaps the most important reason for the frightful casualties that occurred compared to previous wars was because of the rapid fire machine gun. The f it was first used effectively by the Germans in mowing down the French and British offensives in trench warfare. As they tried to come up over the top into no man's land, they would be mowed down by German machine guns. Eventually, it, the machine gun would be employed by both sides. Here's Vickers machine gun crew wearing PH type anti-gas helmets also because get poisonous gas will be another new weapon. Um, this is during the Battle of the Somme, July of 1916. The gunner is wearing a padded waistcoat, enabling him to carry the machine gun barrel because it's hot when they have to move it to another location. Tanks are another um, another weapon, new weapon that was utilized in World War I. They, uh, artillery was now made mobile in contrast to cannon used in previous wars. Tanks could navigate treacherous terrain, but initially they suffered numerous mechanical problems and got bogged down in the mud. They were first used at the Battle of the Somme in 1916 to smash down barbed wire fences but had little effect at helping to take the enemy trench. They were not really effective until the last year of the war, especially for the Triple Entente or the Allied Powers. Um, the British World War I Mark V tank is seen here. The airplane is another new weapon of this war. This means that now the warfare is not just happening on the ground, but in the air. Initial air fights consisted of pistols and rifles fired from planes by hand. <laughs> Eventually, they will start to mount guns on the planes. Germany developed the first fighter plane called the Fokker that synchronized machine guns and propellers because, of course, you can't shoot through your own propeller. So you had to have it synchronized so it would not um, fire through the propellers. In response, France and Britain developed their own fighter squadrons as well, upping the ante even more. Britain used planes to bomb Zeppelin bases in Germany as well. A German airplane shot down during World War I. Poison gas was another new um, weapon used in World War I. Chlorine gas was used by the Germans early in the war. The impact also of mustard gas was largely negated by the use of gas masks by the Allies. Sending over a shell with poisonous gas to burst in the trench to try to kill those living in the trench or force them to come out into no man's land so they could be shot and mowed down. But by the develop with the development of the gas mask, um, it made it so it was uh, less likely to have the effect that they wanted. Germans later used phosgene gas and tear gas in concert for its offensives. Submarines were another new weapon, or German U-boats. Submarines initially used by Germany had devastating effects on Allied shipping throughout the war. So now, naval battles are not just happening on the surface of the water, but also below it. So airplanes bring fighting to the sky, dropping bombs on enemy trenches, um, and eventually fighter planes in the sky. You have, of course, the fighting going on on the ground in the trenches, and now you have fighting going on on top of the water in the sea with naval battles, as well as below the surface with the, um, with the submarines. Britain and France also use submarines. 
The German use of U-boats was the most important reason for why the U.S. eventually entered the war, as we will see in a later slide. Here's German U-boats awaiting their missions. Zeppelins were another allied, um, well, not just that, sorry, there were another weapon used by both sides, Zeppelins or blimps. They were used by Germany first to bomb London and other civilian targets as a weapon of terror. Eventually, they would be used on the other side as well. Eventually, exploding shells were able to destroy Zeppelins in the air. England, here we come. Radio was another thing, another new technology that would be utilized as a weapon, really, in World War I. Uh, wireless technology made communication more effective on the battlefield. The Germans took advantage of Russia's lack of radio capability on the Eastern Front and would ultimately tap into Russian phone lines that were stretched across the battlefields to discover Russian battle plans. Now let's talk a little bit about other theaters of war. The Eastern Front. The war in Eastern Europe was more mobile than it was in Western, uh, on the Western Front. Uh, not nearly as much stalemate warfare going on. Uh, General von Hindenburg and General von Ludendorff uh, were German officers that defeated invading Russian armies at Tannenberg in 1914, the Battle of Tannenberg. This will turn the tide of the war in the east and put Russia on the defensive and put Germany on the offensive, Germany and Austria on the offensive, of course, the Ottoman Empire as well. The, here's a Russian poster, help victims of the war. Though no, numerically superior, the Russians were poorly organized and suffered horrific casualties at the hands of the Germans. They also did not have nearly the stockpiles of weapons that the Germans and the Austrians had. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk will eventually pull Russia out of the war in December of 1917. We'll talk more specifically about that in the Russian Revolution lecture, but just so you know, Vladimir Lenin, after the Bolshevik Revolution, will take Russia out of the war but they were forced, in exchange for, for surrendering, they were forced to give Germany one quarter of Russia's European territory. Germany will never really be able to capitalize on those gains, though, because a year after that, that they will lose the war entirely, and they will be forced to give that territory up as a result of that loss. We'll talk more specifically about that later. The shaded area represents the lost Russian territory as a result of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. It's a lot of territory. Key concept. Okay, so looking more at the Eastern Campaign, Russia was not doing well against um, Germany and Austria, but what about the Turks? Well, the British will be kind of put in charge of the Eastern Front Campaign against the Turks. And it all begins at the Gallipoli campaign in 1915. The British will also utilize some of their imperial forces from Australia and New Zealand, but they will fail to take the Dardanelles as a step toward taking Constantinople and defeating the Turks entirely. The Turks actually gave a good stand at Gallipoli and the British were not able to take, um, to take Gallipoli. 200,000 British troops were killed or wounded. About 500,000 total were wounded or killed. It, th that includes, of course, Australian and New Zealand forces, which were fighting on behalf of the British Empire. One, this is one of the great Ottoman victories of the war and a huge defeat for the Allies, but the British were not done. They would take a different approach after this loss, how to destabilize Turkey or the Ottoman Empire they will turn instead to the Middle East. Britain took great steps to protect the Suez Canal in Egypt, which was their baby, remember. Uh, the British will uh, ultimately gain support from Arab tribes in the Middle East who resented the Ottoman domination of that region. 
So the British will basically approach the Arab tribes and say, hey, if you rebel against the Ottoman Turks and make distract them, you know, from fighting in against us so much in this war, we will guarantee you that you will have your freedom at the close of this war. The British never delivered on those promises, but by fomenting Arab rebellions against the Ottomans, it will allow for the British to be able to come in and ultimately attack the Ottoman Empire and um, force the Ottoman Empire out of the war. So these Arab revolts against the Turks throughout the war, ultimately, that were fostered by the British, ultimately will end the Ottoman Empire's grip on the Middle East. The Arabs received military assistance from such figures as Lawrence of Arabia, British general in charge of the troops there. However, this will result in some problems. The Armenian genocide by the Turks resulted from Ottoman claims that the Armenians were cooperating with the Allies. And so they started to force genocide on all of these people, killing them by the thousands. Perhaps a million Armenians died in what became the first of several genocides of the 20th century. Japan in East Asia and the Pacific is also something that we have to look at when looking at World War I. Japan had sided with the Triple Entente, remember, during the war, the Allied Powers, and significantly increased its influence in the Pacific region as a result. It conquered Germany's island colonies in the Pacific. It increased its sphere of influence in China. And Japan's dramatic increase in the size of its navy and army led to its recognition as one of the great powers in the post-war global diplomacy. This will, of course, become an issue as we are going to be approaching World War II. Now, the British and Allied naval blockade needs to be looked at as well. The goal was to strangle the Central Powers by not allowing any new supplies into the region through this blockade. Starting in April, sorry, starting in 1914, Allies used its superior fleet, the British fleet in particular, and sea mines that were put throughout the Atlantic Ocean to cut the Central Powers off from overseas trade and cause Germany to lose control over its colonial empire. This was when Japan was brought in as well in the Pacific region on the side of the Allies. They would take the German colonies, they would set those mines there uh, for the Allied powers to try to keep the stranglehold over the central powers in Europe. Germany responded by sinking Allied vessels with U-boats. Germany's, Germany's declared exclusion zone of February 15. Ships within this area were liable to search and attack. So Germany's basically saying, if you send any ships into this region, um, we're going to see that as fair game to torpedo them with our U-boats. We will do, they did this in order to try to break the back of the naval blockade. This is when the Lusitania comes into the picture. In 1915, a German U-boat sank a British passenger liner, the Lusitania, killing about 1,200 people, including 128 Americans who were on board. This was focused on in the press in the United States, and it ultimately is responsible for turning U.S. public opinion against Germany. The United States had tried to remain isolated from this war, thinking it a foreign war, a European war, not involving the U.S., up until this point, uh, there was a lot of animosity towards Germany because of this action. Now, the U.S. will not join the war at this point in time, but within two years, the United States will join the war on the side of the Allies against Germany. Here is a, another um, a cartoon showing, it's called Booty 1915, a Disrespect of the World. Uh, Germany is the one that's carrying the disrespect of the world after sinking the Lusitania behind them. 
British propaganda poster illustrating the sinking of the Lusitania by the Germans in 1915, Take Up the Sword of Justice. Germany in 1917 began unrestricted submarine warfare once again, sinking all ships with its U-boats. Now they had suspended this after the sinking of the Lusitania had turned so much of public attention against them. But by 1917, they started it again, sinking all ships with its U-boats that came in their uh, sphere of influence. This is the most important reason ultimately for the U.S. finally determining, okay, we're going to enter this war on the side of the Allies. By war's end, the blockade succeeded in strangling Germany, resulting in thousands of German deaths due to starvation. Key concept. This is also known as a total war, the world's first real total war, which means that it involved massed civilian populations in the war effort, as well as those who were fighting on the front lines. Massive conscription of men drafted most able-bodied men in, um, in their youth, most all able-bodied men through all European nations were drafted into service. In some cases, civilian populations became targets as well in this war, uh, and like the city of London, for example. And this means with civilians being targeted, this is really a total war. All parts of the population are involved in this war. Uh, early in the war, Germany used Zeppelins to bomb London, as I said before. The British blockade resulted in significant starvation for non-combatants in Germany as well. So this shows you it's really a war of attrition, not just warfare being fought on the front lines, but at home as well, being the people at home being impacted as well. And of course, also working in the war effort to keep the munitions and the supplies um, being built and created for the forces fighting on the front line. News was censored all throughout Europe. Propaganda lionized men at the front and dehumanized the enemy. Um, speaking of, you know, Germans as monsters or British as, um, you know, uh, cads, etc., uh, made a lot of soldiers uh, that they see, see the enemy as this more monolith um, rather than fighting actual human beings. Uh, intense nationalism demanded support from the entire population as well. Here's a British propaganda poster. The British were masters of propaganda posters. They were often used, uh, they often used women for recruitment purposes to keep up morale. Women of Britain say go, meaning go honey, my husband, my son, go and fight, defend our great nation. Um, any man who would not go and join the army was seen as a coward. Uh, and of course, using women saying, you must fight for our country, um, you know, as the hero for our country, aided in that, that shaming if you did not join up, if you weren't drafted already. Some historians contend that Germany's aggression in the 1890s sought to rally the masses behind the government and slow down the growth of the SPD. In 1914, the SPD, which was the largest party in the Reichstag, supported the war as part of the civil peace with the Kaiser, the Bergfrieden, the peace holder. The same may have been true in Britain as the issue of Irish independence dominated the headlines. They, this, in other words, the war would focus the, the civilian attention elsewhere to a foreign enemy. British propaganda effectively demonized Germany as the Hun, referring to the Germans as the Huns. Economic production focused on the war effort as well. The fr free market capitalism was abandoned by most nations during the war in favor of strong central planning of the economy. Everything had to be geared towards the war effort. Women replaced male factory workers who were now fighting in the war. This accounted for 43% of the labor force in Russia. Changing attitudes about women 
because of their participation in the war effort, resulted in increased rights for many after the war was over. As we've discussed before, Britain, Germany, Austria, and the U.S. will all have women's rights, women's suffrage um, um, being given after the war is over. Governments use propaganda also to encourage women to join the war effort. Women of Britain, come into the factories. Help your men fighting on the front lines, keeping them well supplied. German women working as assistants on the Western Front as nurses um, as well. Women working in a gun factory in Woolwich, England during World War I, making munitions for the troops. Labor unions supported the war effort and saw increased influence and prestige due to increased demand for labor as well. The rationing of food and scarce commodities was instituted by many nations as well. Civilians financed the war by buying war bonds. This is a Russian war bond poster. War loan for the sake of victory. Basically the government borrowing money from the population. The person buys a war bond. That war, the money is given to the government to help fund the war effort. And then the promise is that you will get the same amount back at a later date, maybe with interest if the economy doesn't falter. Of course, since Russia will experience a revolution at the end of the war, most of these war bonds would not really be honored by the new Bolshevik government. Here is another um, war poster, help us conquer, buy war bonds. This one's from Germany. French war bonds poster, a British war bonds poster, put strength in the final blow, buy war bonds. Each side aimed at starving out the enemy by cutting off vital supplies to civilian populations. It's another reason why we call it a total war. The civilian population was attacked and targeted and on all sides. Increase in centralized political control was the result as well. In France, Georges Clemenceau created a dictatorship during the emergency of the war. Germany became the world's first totalitarian regime um, eventually, and although that word was not used until later in order to control the war effort. The British economy was largely planned and regulated by the government. Diplomacy also in the war. In 1915, neutral Italy, really not neutral, they had been on the side of the uh, central powers but had not really done a lot of active fighting. But in 1915, they declared themselves neutral and then they entered the war against the central powers, their former allies, by um, fighting with the Allied side now, with the promise of some Austrian and Balkan territory at the end of the war. They called it Italia Irredenta, unredeemed Italy, and some German colonies and Turkish territories. Really receive a lot of the territory that they had been promised, however, when the war was over. And this created, created resentment among the Italian population and is a big reason why eventually the fascist government under Mussolini will be able to rise after World War I is over. Another diplomatic um, issue was the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram. This is actually the straw that broke the camel's back and brought the United States into the war. Germany was concerned that the United States would enter the war, especially after, you know, the unrestricted submarine warfare that Germany was doing and they knew that the, the press had been slamming Germany, um, the American press had been slamming Germany since the sinking of the Lusitania. So Germany decided that um, they needed to do something to try to get the United States distracted so they couldn't f eventually fight in the war. And so Germany approached Mexico. Um, remember, the United States had gained a lot of territory in the middle of the 1800s by fighting the Mexican-American War, 
gaining California and New Mexico and Nevada and other areas fighting over Texas as well. And so Germany proposed an alliance with Mexico against the U.S. Saying that Mexico could receive much of the southwestern United States that they had lost to the United States 50, 60 years earlier if the Central Powers won. Mexico refused and this telegram was leaked to the United States Central Intelligence uh, um, Committee. It really wasn't the CIA yet, but it was their, their spy network. Ultimately, the Balfour Note also is another thing um, that is part of um, a diplomatic blunder of World War I. In 1917, the, the Arabs and Jews in Palestine were both promised autonomy if they joined with the Allies, which they can't both have autonomy if they both want the same territory. So that was an issue as well. So the Zimmerman note, because um, the United States found out about it, um, that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back and brought the U.S. into the war. The Balfour note, as we will see after World War um, I is over, both the Arabs and the Jews will have issues of wanting territory in Palestine. Um, the Arabs had had a lot of promises made to them by the British and the French as well to destabilize the Ottoman Empire um, that will not be, um, those promises will not be followed through on either. It goes a long way to explain the resentment in that part of the world to this day against the West. Britain declared sympathy for Zionism ultimately and the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine as we know and this will of course anger the Arabs who were promised also autonomy if they joined with the Allied effort. This new policy seemed to contradict the British support for Arab nationalism that they had promised back in 1915 um, with the Arab revolts. Key concept. Wilsonian idealism and the 14 points, January 1918. This, of course, was the U.S. plan to try to end the war. The United States had entered the war in 1917. Um, our men arrived on the front lines pretty much, and the western front lines, pretty much at the same time that the Russians were pulling out of the war on the eastern front. Um, this actually worked to the advantage of the Allies because at first it seemed like if Russia pulls out of this war, Germany will not have to divide its forces along a two-front war and ultimately they could beat the British and the French, they worried, on the Western Front um, if they got to devote all their troops to the Western Front. But the United States forces came in about the same time that the Eastern Front crumbled and so that will be the last nail in the coffin. Our men were well fed, they were trained, they were not weary, war weary after four years of long war. They were actually called doughboys by the, um, the other soldiers because they were, you know, pudgy and <laughs> well fed, not starving. Um, anyhow, eventually by the, by the last year of the war, Woodrow Wilson, the United States President, was the only world leader who really had a plan for how to end the war and what should happen at the end of the war. So this U.S. plan to end the war along liberal democratic lines was um, Wilson's 14 points. And here are the key provisions to the 14 points. That secret treaties should be abolished. That there should be freedom of the seas. That economic barriers between nations should be removed and they should reduce armament burdens throughout all of the nations, meaning reduction of arms, demilitarizing all nations. And also self-determination, the promise of independence to oppressed minority groups like the Poles, millions which lived in Germany and Austria-Hungary should also be guaranteed. The adjustment of colonial claims in interests of both native peoples and colonizers. And German evacuation of Russia, those territories that they had just gotten from Russia um, a year before. The restoration of Belgium. The return of Alsace and Lorraine to France. The evacuation and restoration of the Balkans. 
and the return of Schleswig to Denmark that they had lost back in the 1860s with the um, the Prussian Danish War. The adjustment of Italy's borders along ethnic lines as well and autonomy for non-Turkish parts of the Turkish Empire. The 14th point would be his baby, Wilson's baby, and he was willing to negotiate away a lot of the other points to get this one. He wanted the creation of an international organization to provide for the collective security of all. This foreshadowed what would be the League of Nations that was created after the war. He wanted this so much, a way to come together through open diplomacy, to discuss problems rather than coming to blows over things. He thought that was the wave of the future to maintain peace forever and ever. Um, the League of Nations will ultimately be a failure. And as we will see, the failure of that League by the time we get to um, the late 1930s will bring about yet another world war. Okay, so how does the war end? Yes, Wilson has these points in place, but we need to actually win the war. It looked as if the Allies were going to win. That's why he was able to initiate these. But how did the Allies win? As I said before, a lot of it does have to do with the fact that the offensive capability of the um, Allied powers was increased once the U.S. joined the war. There was the Meuse-Argonne Offensive in the spring of 1918. Um, Germany transferred divisions from the Eastern Front after the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and Russia pulling out of the war was signed to the Western Front and mounted a massive offensive. But the U.S. had entered the war in time to assist Britain and France in stopping that German offensive on the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Here are U.S. soldiers during the Meuse-Argonne Offensive of 1918. This was fought in the Meuse-Argonne Forest uh, in Belgium, eventually um, almost, almost in exactly the same place. Uh, years later, in, um, at the end of World War II, the Battle of the Bulge will be fought pretty much in the same place, the same forest. Germany, how many will be left to enjoy the fruits of your victory? <clears throat> Three million Germans killed since the war began. Casualties of 400,000 in present offensive. This shows you that the German people were starting to realize that this was a hopeless war, that they were not going to be able to win. By 1918, they were try pleading with their Kaiser to end the war. And of course, he refused. Kaiser William II. The Central Powers sought peace eventually, however. They had no choice but to seek peace. Germany was forced to surrender ultimately and seek a peace agreement. They wanted a peace agreement based on Wilson's 14 points, believing that they would get fairer treatment because Wilson's 14 points were very idealistic. He wanted to share the blame for the war over all of those involved in it, not just blaming one side or one nation or another, for example. Um, he wanted to demilitarize everybody, not just one nation over another. Uh, so they believed that central powers, especially Germany, believed that if they sued for peace based on those 14 points, they would get better treatment um, at the treaty negotiations. Austria, Germany and Austria-Hungary were both racked with revolution by this point. Um, um, Austria-Hungary actually surrendered on November 3rd, 1918, sued for peace. Uh, Germany agreed to an armistice which began on November 11th of 1918. An armistice was a cease of, of fighting, so a, um, a treaty negotiations could begin. This is the beginning of what's called Armistice Day in Europe. Armistice Day is November 11th. It was, the armistice was signed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to end the fighting on the Western Front. Of course, now November 11th in the United States is celebrated as Veterans Day. It's still called Armistice Day 
throughout the rest of Europe, however. Wilhelm II, with the armistice, was forced to abdicate his throne, and he fled to Holland. This is another British punch cartoon. Now then, all together, trying to push um, the world out from under the feet of the German Kaiser. Greedy ambition was what he was being hanged on. This shows you that many of the world leaders saw Germany as the primary aggressor and to why this war began, even though technically that's not completely accurate. Key concept. Key concept. So, the Paris Peace Conference will begin their meetings in early 1919. And it begins with the Big Four. The Big Four are members of the government from the four um, allied powers that were left. William Lloyd George from Great Britain, George Clemenceau from France, Woodrow Wilson from the United States, and Orlando, Prime Minister Orlando from Italy. The Central Powers were excluded from the negotiations as France was concerned with its future security. So folks, this peace treaty, normally with a peace treaty, both sides that have been fighting in the war come together to hammer out the details. Nobody from the losing side was invited to the peace treaty negotiations. Instead, the peace would be dictated to them, and if they refused to accept the treaty terms, the war would continue, would start up again. Germany and Austria, and of course the Ottoman Empire that had already really been knocked out of the war, could not afford to fight anymore, and the Western Allies knew it they had them over a barrel. And this is why so many of Wilson's idealistic 14 points get sold down the river, because France in particular wants revenge. They want revenge for all that they had lost in the war. Most of the Western Front was fought on their land. They wanted revenge for going back to the Prussia, the uh, Franco-Prussian War of 1871. They were still angry about that humiliating defeat too. They wanted blood from Germany. Italy actually left the conference angry that it would not get some of those territories that they had been promised in 1915. And so ultimately that left the three, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and Wilson at Versailles. So, the Treaty of Versailles is the big treaty that comes out of the Paris Peace Conference. After Orlando had left, the Treaty of Versailles will be negotiated by the big three that are left. The treaty terms of the Treaty of Versailles are extremely punitive towards Germany in particular. Mandates were created for former colonies and territories of the Central Powers as part of this. Much of the Middle East was now controlled by Britain and France. So those promises that Britain had made to the Middle East, to the Arab um, nations, that they would gain independence if they supported uh, their efforts in trying to destabilize the Ottoman Empire, were never fulfilled. Those promises were never fulfilled. Instead, Great Britain and France took over most of the area. That's what we call the mandate system. And here you see those were former um, German colonies that now became mandates of Great Britain and France. Key concept. Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty is really the big one that angers Germany so much. Article 231 placed sole blame for the war on Germany. And this resulted in severe punishment in the rest of the terms. Germany had to accept total responsibility for this war beginning and happening. Now folks, we know that there was more involved than just Germany instigating this war. 
We know that Austria was taking territory in the Balkans. We know that Serbia was fighting back. We know that they had promises from Russia. We know that this was not just Germany. However, Germany will be seen by those Western allies as the impetus behind everything. The aggressive, aggressive nature that Germany had had in imperialism throughout the 1890s, largely due to Kaiser Wilhelm II, was now seen as the backbone of why this war happened. Um, and so they had to accept full responsibility for the war. This is not a fair thing at all, and this will cause a great deal of resentment among the German population towards those Western allies <clears throat> in the years after the war. This goes a long way to explain why eventually there will be a second world war. Resentment among the Germans uh, will lead to the rise of a totalitarian dictatorship in Germany under a man who promised to bring Germany back to its glory again saying that they no longer needed to abide by a treaty that was dictated to them that was a stab in the back. They didn't even get invited to the peace conference. Of course, that's Adolf Hitler. We'll see how all that pans out in a later unit. So, Article 231, place sole blame for the war on Germany. Germany was also forced to pay huge reparation payments to both Britain and France for the costs of the war. Germany's army and navy were also severely reduced to almost nothing, which goes against the rules of sovereignty. You should have the right to defend yourself, and they weren't going to be able to. Also, the Rhineland, the uh, territory between Great, sorry, between France and Germany, was demilitarized. The Saar coal mines were also taken over by France. So folks, if you think of it this way, Germany has lost its colonial empire. It has lost this area of the Saar, the coal mines that they could use to help their industry. They have lost a lot of the um, colonies which gave them raw materials for the industry. And now they have their power for their industry taken away from them. This ultimately puts Germany in a situation to not being able to make money at all um, economically it, it it punishes them it hurts them yet they still have these huge war reparation payments to make it doesn't make sense we've taken germany's ability to make money away from them yet we're charging them these huge reparation payments and if they can't pay them you know we take sanctions against them this of course is another reason why there's so much resentment among the German population towards the West in the interwar years, which leads them to trust a man who promised to bring Germany out of that depression again, Adolf Hitler. Germany lost all of its colonies. German territory was given to Poland, the Polish corridor separated Germany from East Prussia. Denmark got Schleswig, and France got Alsace and Lorraine back after losing it in the Franco-Prussian War. And other smaller lands would go to Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Lithuania. Here are all the territories that were ceded to different places. Key concept. The League of Nations will be created as part of the Versailles Treaty, though. So even though Wilson's 14 points were magnanimous and were, would have been less punitive towards Germany, he ended up agreeing to more punitive terms towards Germany in exchange for the other Allied powers agreeing to the creation of the League of Nations. <clears throat> now, Germany and Russia were not included in the League of Nations initially because, of course, Russia pulled out of the war um, against the other allies, um, 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 you know, against their, their allies. Um, and Germany, of course, was the big losing nation in 
in the war. So they're not going to be included in the League of Nations either. And this will actually weaken the League from the outset. Another problem is that the United States will never be able to join the League of Nations either. Even though this was Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson's key point in the 14 points. You see what happens is when the president negotiates a peace treaty, it still needs to pass through the Senate. They have to ratify the treaty. The U.S. Senate at the time failed to ratify the Versailles Treaty because they saw it as too punitive towards Germany and it could cause problems down the line. If they had signed off on the treaty, the U.S. Senate felt that this would mean that Germany would eventually want revenge and it could pull the U.S. into yet another war. So they refused to sign the treaty, trying to avoid that scenario. Of course, it didn't work. But by refusing to sign the treaty, to ratify the treaty, the U.S. cannot join the League of Nations, which was part of that treaty. So that's the real irony here. The League of Nations was Wilson's baby. He wanted it. He negotiated away a lot of his other terms that would have been fairer towards Germany. He agreed to more punitive terms towards Germany to try to get the League of Nations. And then the U.S. cannot even be a member of that League of Nations. That is the irony of all ironies. So without the U.S. being in the League of Nations, you can guess that that league will be a paper tiger. It will have no teeth from the get-go. It's nothing but a good joke. And ultimately, the League of Nations will fail to avert another world war. The League was thus born as a mere shadow of what it had originally been attended, intended to achieve. <clears throat> now, the impact of World War I on European society Let's talk a little bit about that, because remember, it was a total war and all levels of the population were involved. Massive casualties, of course. 10 million soldiers were dead. 10 million civilians were dead. And also, many died from a 1918 influenza epidemic, a pandemic, if you will. Perhaps 15 million died also in the Russian Revolution and the subsequent Russian Civil War that was fought. So if you think of all of that, it's around 44 million casualties from this war or from things that were associated with this war. Thus, the birth rate fell significantly after the war, though illegitimate births increased. Overall, the birth rate fell. So many men, an entire generation was lost. Here's World War I deaths. The Central Powers, military 22%, Central Power civilian 22%, Entente military 36%, and Entente civilian is 20%. So if you look at it, the Allied Powers, the Entente, they actually lost more people. They had more deaths than the Central Powers, even though they came out on top because so much of the war was fought on French soil. That's a lot of it. The civilian population was devastated by it. Key concept. World War I promoted greater social equality, however, thus blurring class distinctions and lessening the gap between the rich and the poor, the great equalizer, if you will. Of course, the Russian Revolution was a byproduct of the war. Uh, it happened after Russia pull. I'm sorry, that is one of the reasons why Russia pulls out of the war because the revolution at home toppled the government in exchange for the Bolshevik power. The Russian Revolution abolished the nobility and gave women more rights than any other country in Europe, oddly enough, under the Russian communist government. Women received the right to vote in Britain the same year that the war ended. Germany soon followed, and of course the United States by 1920. The nobility in Germany, Austria, and Russia lost much of its influence and prestige. During the war, women took over the jobs of men who were fighting in the war, but were paid lower wages. Dissent increased as the war continued. 
In Germany, militant socialists and anti-war activists like Rosa Luxemburg and Clara Zetkin were imprisoned for trying to convince fellow socialists not to support the war effort. Large crowds of women in France, Austria, and Italy protested working conditions or high prices. Government censorship existed virtually every country and people increasingly grew dissatisfied with the integrity of their governments. It also was an end to long-standing royal dynasties. How many long-standing royal dynasties toppled due to World War I? Well, the Habsburg dynasty was removed in Austria and it had been around for 500 years. The Romanov dynasty was removed in Russia with the Russian Revolution happening and that had lasted 300 years. The Hohenzollern dynasty was removed in Germany and it had lasted 300 years. And the Ottoman Empire was destroyed, dismantled completely, and it had lasted 500 years four major royal dynasties that had been around for three to five hundred years were toppled by World War I. The political map of Europe was completely redrawn as well. The creation of some new states that had not existed really before. Poland gets its freedom. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Yugoslavia there's no longer an Austrian Empire. Austria is reduced to Vienna and some forest land. All of those territories that had once been part of the Austrian Empire now become independent states. Albania regained its sovereignty as well. Germany was split in two by the Polish corridor. The former Yugoslavia you see here. The Russian Revolution resulted in the world's first communist country, all as an impact of World War I. German nationalists' resentment of the Harsh Versailles Treaty doomed the newly created Weimar Republic in Germany. After taking the, the Kaiser off the throne, the Allied powers forced Germany to accept a republican form of government. But by sacking the Weimar Republic with all of these treaty terms that were so punitive towards Germany, they pretty much doomed it from the start. And this is one of the reasons why the Weimar Republic will be, will be helpless to stop the rise of the Nazis um, throughout the 1930s. John Maynard Keynes was a British economist who wrote a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. In 1919, he published this book and he basically spoke out against the treaty being too harsh towards the losing nations. He predicted the harsh terms of the treaty would hurt Germany's economy and thus the economy of the rest of Europe and it would ultimately lead to significant future political unrest. And he was right, folks. We'll learn more about that as we move forward in the interwar years leading up to, of course, World War II. German anger with the treaty was partially responsible for the rise of Hitler and the Nazis in the early 1930s, although the Great Depression was the immediate reason, which we'll discuss in a later lecture. The image on the right here is Hitler's anti-Versailles poster design. It was a chained Germania beneath the slogan, only national socialism will free Germany from the lie of soul guilt, meaning that war guilt clause that they had, were forced to accept along with the other punitive treaty terms. This kind of propaganda will go a long way to convince a grieving population that the only way they will ever have a nation worth its salt again is to go against this unfair treaty that was forced down their throats. And they can do that only if they join with the Nazis. There was a shift in financial power also to the United States 
the United States becomes the big um, winner, I guess you would say, economically after World War One is over. Of course, we had only been fighting in the war for the last year as well, so we were not nearly as economically devastated as the rest of Europe. Europe lost its preeminent position economically that it had enjoyed for 500 years. The U.S. became the world's leading creditor and the greatest producer due to the drain of Europe's resources due to the war.